when you think about it, the Chinese are saying uh, Asia for Asians. We're doubling down. We're saying we're going to make our alliances stronger, our military presence stronger, our trade presence stronger through trade liberalization. It might not be so far-fetched, after all, to say we're, we're a bit on a bit of a collision course. Uh, so how does this play out? What is, how, how does this um, uh, really unfold if we give it our, our best guess? Well, I would say, number one, we have to really dispense with a lot of the flawed assumptions that have driven our policy for quite some time. What do I mean by that? I would say we made two great assumptions at the time of the opening our relationship with China, and we bet pretty much all of our policy approaches based on those assumptions. We made our, our policy approaches based on those assumptions. Number one assumption was that through our engagement and through our economic activity, through our investment, just through interacting with, with Americans, China's going to start to change. They're going to start, their economy is going to start to grow. They're going to become wealthier. And they're going to start to be more like us. They're going to they're change. Countries get richer. People demand political rights. They demand more freedoms. And by the way, they'll see what a great example we are. Our businesses will go in and they'll see what it looks like to work in a company that respects workers, believes in the rule of law, and, and, and they'll become more like us. Well, uh, not so fast on that one as well. Um, my friend Jim Mann, who used to be the LA Times uh, bureau chief in Beijing, wrote a book called The China Fantasy. So just based on the, China, uh, on the title alone, you, you have an idea of where I'm going with this. Um, what, what Jim said was, this is complete nonsense, that the Chinese will take the economic benefit, they'll take the knowledge, the know-how, the technology, but they're not going to become more like us. And they're sure as heck not going to liberalize and, and democratize the way so many people thought they were. And this is certainly reflected in all the reporting we do on China internally on their human rights, religious freedom. Uh, if you're interested, the State Department does do annual reports, one specifically on religious freedom, the other one more generally on human rights. Uh, there's also commissions in Washington that are congressionally mandated, one called the Congressional Executive Commission on China that looks at rule of law and human rights. All of this is very well documented, and the evidence is very strong that China is backsliding in most categories that, that I would say we care about. Um, religious freedom, uh, Jeff talked about the very uh, tragic, unfortunate, um, and really ugly incident that occurred recently. But more generally, there, there has been a heavier hand when it comes to house churches, when it comes to the practice of uh, people's faith, and, and, and um, it's, it's not just limited to organizations like Falun Gong, which they claim is a cult organization. It's directed at, at mainstream uh, religious uh, faiths, uh, very much to include Christianity. Um, human rights, more generally, crack down on uh, internet freedom, crack down on uh, lawyers, uh, people who represent people who are seeking more personal freedoms, um, uh, harsher treatment of people who protest for their rights, whether that be workers who aren't getting paid or people who are putting up with uh, conditions that are, that are inhumane. Any lawyer that might represent those people, there's a good chance those folks are going to end up in, in prison or dealt with harshly. Um, and that, that heavier hand is actually extending outside of, of mainland China. Uh, maybe some of you read about the incidents where some people from a Hong Kong book publishing company were basically kidnapped, uh, taken off the street, and brought into mainland China because they were preparing to publish a book about Xi Jinping and some of his uh, personal shortcomings, shall we say. And the Chinese authorities decided to nab these people off the street, bring them to China, and in two cases, force them to give video confessions straight out of the Cold War, uh, straight out of what used to see our POWs forced to do in, in uh, Vietnam, very kind of ugly uh, 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 forced confessions for people who were just merely involved in book publishing. So uh, this, is, uh, this is certainly a country that fears its people, uh, doesn't respect their their rights, and uh, certainly has made a calculation that uh, as they go forward, they can't afford greater liberty and they can't afford any threats to their uh, 
authority and, and they, they view uh, personal freedom and faith as, as part of that equation. Um, so that's quite unfortunate. Um, I think, so that's assumption number one. The second great assumption was if we draw China out into the region, if we draw them out globally, if we make them an active part in regional organizations, regional institutions, if we give them a seat at the table and ask them to, to be problem solvers alongside us, eventually they'll see themselves as having a stake in these organizations and in the status quo, and eventually they'll start behaving more responsibly and more constructively. In fact, we even gave this, this a title. We called it the Responsible Stakeholder Approach. And so we actually actively work to get China outside, for, you know, not just an inward-looking country, but be more active in the life of Asia and be more active in global institutions. Well, guess what? Part of that worked. They showed up and they started participating. But the second part, behaving responsibly and constructively, a big question mark. In fact, they arrived at the table with a seat and decided they had their own interests and their own equities and their own way of doing things. And the status quo may have been fine for a while. In fact, they benefited from it a great deal. It helped them have a region that was peaceful and stable and allowed them to focus on growing their economy, but now they feel stronger. They want to change some of that status quo. And in some instances, they're going to change the organizations that they're joining. In other instances, they're just going to create new organizations to challenge the existing ones. Maybe some of you read about the, the recent case where China formed uh, the Asia uh, AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's, it sounds pretty dull, right? Uh, but this was the Chinese saying, we don't want to leave development just to the Western powers through the Asia Development Bank and the World Bank. We want our own way and our own resources so that we can use this a tool of our diplomacy in Asia and, and try to reach outcomes that are more beneficial to us and not just the broader community. Um, the whole notion of, of freedom of navigation in in the South China Sea and in the Western Pacific. I mentioned briefly this island building campaign. Well, it's being done with a purpose. They claim the entire South China Sea as Chinese sovereign territory. And for them to make that meaningful, they have to have military presence throughout these islands. And they have to be able to challenge people who say the opposite, that no, it's international water. So two great assumptions too highly flawed at best, that China would reform and liberalize, and that they would behave responsibly and, and constructively if we, we drew them out. So clearly, uh, some of our approaches of the past uh, have not been working and, and have been uh, highly flawed at best.